Welcome to Health System CIO's interview with Sahan Fernando, Chief Information Security Officer with Radies Children's Hospital. I'm Anthony Guerra, founder and editor-in-chief. Sahan, thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on today. All right. If you want to start out, tell me a little bit about your organization and your role there. Absolutely. So Rady Children's Hospital, we are a healthcare system based out of San Diego, California. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a couple different areas that we serve our pediatric population. Uh, so that includes all the way from uh, you know pre pre-birth uh, support all the way up to birth and um, through through later stages of life. I believe the oldest population we serve goes up to about 21 years old. So we really work through um, through all stages of development with our with our youth, um, serving not just San Diego County but uh, Imperial County and Riverside County, uh, as well as working with other hospitals on strategic partnerships, both uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, my role as, uh, as the Chief Information Security Officer is to oversee the uh, information security program uh, across all of our uh, organization's units. So that, uh, that role oversees a team that, that serves uh, not just the acute care hospital, but our genomics institute, our primary care, uh, and various other interests. Very good. Okay, so I, I like to find out how people wound up in this interesting spot. Uh, pretty niche, as I say, it's not just healthcare, it's not just I IT, it's not just security, it's healthcare, IT, security. So how did you wind up here? Boy, well, the uh, shorter version, a lot of luck. Uh, definitely <laughs> very, very fortunate. Um, so I went, attended uh, Gonzaga University uh, up in Spokane, Washington, and I had studied computer science, a little math, uh, but really my major was in business management information systems. Uh, and so really growing up, very classic uh, casual computer use, and as the internet became a little bit more ubiquitous, uh, finding lots of ways to explore you know, gaming and knowledge and media, all sorts of fun stuff. And so uh, I knew I always liked technology. Uh, initially, I was really looking casting a pretty wide net as I was getting ready to finish school. Um, I definitely waited a little long on uh, the job search front. Um, didn't really have much skill in terms of coding, uh, even after the comp sci classes, just really was never my strength. And so uh, as I was searching around, I really was looking more at, was it tech related and was it in a place I felt like living in? I was very fortunate that uh, I applied for an information security analyst job for a uh, managed security service provider in town uh, and somehow got an interview. Um, my former boss, who's uh, still a very close friend of mine, uh, said that uh, the cover letter went, apparently went a long way uh, providing that. and. So I managed to get an interview and they decided to take a chance on me, even though I didn't know a significant amount of the more technical questions uh, that were very security specific. They asked what a botnet was and I, I was pretty candid that I wasn't sure, but I also could figure out what it was if uh, you gave me two minutes. And so uh, started there as just a tier one analyst in uh, a rather fledgling security operations center. And, uh, being fresh out of college, uh, I'm also a former uh, Division One athlete for men's rowing, and so I think that competitive energy really needed an outlet, and so I put it into into work. Um, my parents also providing a good example in terms of work ethic and the very classic, you know, work hard to advance yourself. Um, so uh, I was fortunate I didn't have a lot of other commitments. Um, I, st I was volunteer coaching, but otherwise I just was able to really apply myself uh, to learning more about the field I had just wandered into. And uh, especially initially feeling very overwhelmed about, oh my gosh, what did I sign up for? I don't understand what this is. Uh, you know, one of those teaching anecdotes I always like to share with folks is, uh, you know, we all start somewhere. And I used to, uh, for a couple of days, I kept plugging in, uh, RFC 1918 addresses, you know, private addresses into IP void, not realizing that, of course, you know, that there's no context on that for 
outside of the internal network. And so uh, with that, a lot of help from my peers, uh, very supportive management, very patient management, and a good amount of trial and error with uh, internal IT and then uh, helping customers, really taking advantage of opportunities to continue growing and not just InfoSec, but uh, just other tech stuff. Um, as I mentioned, it was a service provider. And so it was professional services, security consulting and managed services. So I worked a lot with our managed IT customers. Uh, and that was a good way to, I think, develop one, a little bit of uh, not just empathy, but actual sympathy for sysadmins uh, and how to work with them. What does that actually look like for them on the day to day and their uh, millions of priorities? Um, but also that viewpoint of, okay, here, InfoSec says, does this thing, what does it actually mean to go do it? Um, and so from there, I just kept uh, working towards opportunities to advance, uh, eventually was able to move into a management position and uh, work my way from there. And then I uh, was very fortunate to join the Rady team in uh, October, 2020. Take me from that jump from, from non-healthcare to healthcare. Uh, what what made you interested? Was it just an opportunity came your way? Um, because I'm interested in the perspective someone from outside of healthcare has when they come into healthcare. Um, there's a lot of things to learn there, but they also bring a lot to the table. There's a big appetite for people from outside of healthcare who know technology to come in, but I'm sure there's also a learning curve. So take me through that transition and how that opportunity and why you decided healthcare as opposed to financial services or anything else. Yeah, uh, great question. Loaded question for sure in a good way. Um, so I, in my former, former roles, uh, did a lot of consulting work, um, you know, staff augmentation. And at being a managed service provider, we worked with a lot of financial and healthcare uh, clients, especially being regulated industries, uh, and really the ones who are most risk averse for obvious reasons, um, they were, they reached out quite a bit. And so my first real experience with healthcare uh, was as a uh, staff augmentation resource at a uh, now defunct healthcare system in California. And uh, at the time, they didn't have any any security personnel. And so we, we were brought in to try and really bring things up to shape as much as we could. Um, they were going through uh, quite a lot of strategic organizational shifts, um, we'll call it. And so there was a lot of not just where are we at now, but also how do we bridge the gap to where we want to be uh, and address a very significant amount of risk. Uh, and that thankfully, well, thankfully or not thankfully, that actually coincided with uh, when WannaCry came out um, you know, they, there was a decent amount of risk from Windows XP system still on there, things like that. So that was my first foray into really uh, hands-on healthcare IT work, uh, healthcare information security, because even though my, my role was focused on being an information security engineer and more technical things, I got to deal a little bit with um, how do we look at it more holistically on information flows throughout the system, both electronic and uh, and on paper and such. And so that, uh, that was my first experience. And then uh, we started working with a uh, pediatric healthcare institution uh, in the Southwest, uh, doing a lot of consulting and managed security work as well. And so uh, we were very closely integrated with them. Um, I think they still do quite a lot with my former firm. And so they, uh, that was another opportunity to really learn more about the ins and outs of um, what does it look like for, you know, staff on the security team when you're, when you're dealing in these very complex systems and tons of teams, um, you know, it was a real eye opener when it was, Hey, we got this alert. We want to, you know, quarantine this host because we think there might be an infection. It was like, well, you got to go here and open this ticket and route it to this team and then call. And it was, it was a lot of understanding what kind of processes are in place and how you kind of work with the system, even as a outside consultant. And so uh, through all of that, um, I always liked healthcare, just, I like the idea of, of working for uh, an organization with a, a real mission and, and pediatric healthcare, um, that, that hospital 
really talked uh, a pretty decent amount about the mission and that really struck a chord with me. Um, you know, I, I think most people go the fortunate route and don't have many encounters as a child in the hospital outside of primary care. Uh, I had asthma growing up that was uh, more severe. So I had uh, encounters where I had to stay overnight from asthma attacks. Um, and so being able to now be in a position where you can contribute to that sort of mission and vision of um, both acute and primary care and other other sorts of ways to enhance the lives of these of these kids that really puts you in a at least for me personally <clears throat> that that was where the opportunity with Rady really um, seemed like a, a dream come <clears throat> excuse me a dream come true in that sense um, that opportunity to really work with uh, pediatric populations and especially in the nonprofit space because then it really is really is focused on the mission. Yeah, I don't think you get more meaningful than pediatric healthcare. Um, I got to go back because you mentioned something. It was a pretty interesting. Um, you, you mentioned this cover letter that you, that you wrote that you thought had a tremendous impact and you kind of left that hanging. So I got to ask, what, what was in that? Uh, it was, there was obviously some generic text, but it was, I tried to tailor it to the firm. I mean, show that I took enough effort to look at their website, you know, hey, I'm applying this position. Here's my background. Here's some stuff about me. Um, would love to, you know, connect and have an interview. Um, so fairly high level. Uh, the fun story that we always like to to share is uh, during the interview or at the end of the interview. Um, so I walked in. I was fully suited up, um, mm -hmm. pinstripes and all, because that was all I had. <laughs> pinstripes, and, nice. Uh, the it's this it, this is a very classic. Um, kind of tech company. And so the, the two interviewers, one was my soon to be boss uh, and still one of my best friends. And he was wearing a Notre Dame t-shirt and jeans. So I knew I liked that part of the culture, uh, but my family is a very deep Notre Dame family. Uh, my dad teaches there, my brother and sister-in-law went there. So we're very, um, very much about the Irish. And so, uh, I meant this in all sincerity, and I stand by this, that I liked him a lot just from our first first meeting, and I just casually dropped at the end, uh, you know, hey, if you ever go want to go out to a game, uh, our family always loves to try and make that happen for folks, so just, <laughs> you have my contact information, reach out and, uh, and let me know, and so um, I told him it's not a bribe, but <laughs> I did a good job anyways. <laughs> I'm glad it worked out. Um, you mentioned there uh, in that cover letter uh, made me think of something. A, so I spoke to another CISO and we talked about the, you know, there's a lot of talk about a lack of talent out there. Not a lot of people looking for jobs, not a lot of qualified people, especially in healthcare, especially in healthcare IT, probably especially even more so in healthcare IT security. And he was saying, I don't need you to come in with all this experience, but I want you to come in showing you did your homework that you did your homework on the organization and that you've done your homework in general on what's going on in healthcare from a security point of view. So again, you don't need 10, 10 certifications, but show me you did your homework. And from what you're saying, you did your homework. That's a best practice. Do you see applicants coming in not having done their homework? Uh, occasionally. Um, I think that that does occur. Uh, people apply online. I, we don't generally proceed with an interview. I do try and give feedback whenever possible uh, to applicants on, hey, you know, we're choosing to move move on at this time or we're not going to interview at this time, but here's maybe two seconds of feedback on your resume mm -hmm. as to why I made that decision. Right. Uh, so yeah, that I think it goes a long way to to show that you did do that homework, uh, at least read through the job description with more than you know, a minute of, of thought and really prepping for yourself for what are you getting into? Uh, and I would, I would agree with that, especially that um, certifications um, are really a double-edged sword. And I say that as someone that used to really hunt for those as a former consultant, uh, you know, they, they show you can pass a test. So you're kind of going off of the quality of the test and some people aren't good test takers, right? Mm -hmm. Some people are great test takers. So a lot of context gets lost in there. It's just a way to maybe open up some more doors, but um, I would concur with that person that 
I really look at more, uh, what's your experience? Do you bring something unique? Did you write something compelling that caught, caught my attention as much as possible? Um, maybe I'm old school. I really like when people add a cover letter because it does mm -hmm. take that extra two seconds versus mass uploading your resume everywhere. And so um, I think the other part too is obviously with the mission that's important here um, is something in your resume speaking to what we're trying to do here. Uh, and mm -hmm. so I think that's always going to be different depending on your management style, the type of team that you run, the culture of the organization. You know, not everywhere is a good fit for everyone is what I tell someone. And that's not a reflection on, on you or us in a bad way. It's just sometimes what you're looking for isn't what we are looking for. Um, you know, and that's, that's great. I'd rather save you and us uh, a lot of a lot of pain and, and be realistic so that if you want to come here awesome because we got to sell we have to sell ourselves to you as well um, it's just as much about you interviewing us are you feeling that uh talent dearth out there are you seeing a lack of of available people uh, for the skill sets you're looking for uh i would say that um i was expecting uh, more people to apply when we posted positions within the last year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's great not having to sort through, you know, tons and tons on the flip side of that. So I I'm okay with it. I, I personally reviewed every single one that came through at least, uh, you know, I didn't want it to get pre-screened uh, because I, I believe in giving, you know, opportunities for folks uh, that could get, you know, screened out by, by various pieces of, of uh, recruiting software. And so, uh, I will say we had two net new positions this year, uh, and it took, it took some time to fill those. A lot of that's also my fault. Just we're busy, mm -hmm. want to be intentional. And, um, we had a few, it wasn't just one interview and I, I wanted them to make sure they had a good sense of who we were, uh, not just on the InfoSec team, but also, uh, a chance to talk with other, other teams, right. The people that they would really be working with. Uh, you know, week to week. And so that was one thing that uh, I thought was very useful was here's a chance to talk with someone from the infrastructure team, for instance, 10 minutes, nothing necessarily technical, but just get their feedback in terms of, hey, is this someone that you want to work with? Right. Um, you know, because that, that if, if, if we kind of break down those silos more, um, one, I wanted them to know that, you know, they have my respect and their opinion matters. And you know, I didn't want to, you know, bring in someone that, yeah, they know a bunch of security stuff, but uh, they can't collaborate with people who aren't security people. Right. Right. So I know you're, you're in Spokane, right? Um, the organization is in San Diego. Um, so when, does it vary by position? When you have an open position, are you looking, are there certain positions where you want them sort of on site and other positions where they could be anywhere in the country? How are you handling that uh, with the new, you know, work remote workforce environment, which is something you also need to secure? So we can roll into that discussion right after this one. But how are you handling um, staffing up? So we are super, super fortunate. Um, the organization was always very forward thinking on the remote work front, um, even prior to COVID. Uh, you know, we have employees in multiple states uh, that were full-time remote prior, including members of my own team. And so uh, they were always very cognizant at Rady that uh, good, good talent, really good people who want to stay, you find a way to make it work uh, as much as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they understand that, you know, it, it, the common phrase is very much around, you know, mission first people always, uh, and that gets echoed from the CEO all the way down. Uh, it's a very cohesive message. And so we really do put a lot into um, the people that make our mission possible. And so thankfully for InfoSec, we're able to have uh, talent just about anywhere. I mean, if there was really a crisis, we're not going to be worrying about the extra two hours for someone to fly down. And so we, uh, we have a lot of folks that are in the San Diego area, but my approach has been, what, what do you want? You're an adult. Do you want to come in every day? Great. We'll have a space for you. Do you want to come in once a month? That's fine too. We'll have a hotel desk or something. So 
uh, we really look at it as a, as a flexible approach um, based on each person's needs. And then I just let them know, hey, I'm going to be in the office these few days. If you want to come and meet up in person, great. Um, you know, hey, we can go grab lunch outside, you know, these days and have a chance to connect in person. So uh, that, that's been our approach. It seems like it's worked really well. Um, you know, they can go in obviously on their own if they want to meet up and uh, do some strategic projects together in person. So uh, the, the hospital has definitely been very, very supportive of that. Like I said, we'll go right into one of the biggest topics for, for all CISOs, but healthcare CISOs as well, is the remote workforce. How, how has it changed the um, attack surface, uh, potential vulnerabilities, having uh, lots of staff working in a hybrid fashion, some totally remote, some in and out? People want complete mobility, flexibility. They want to work when they want, where they want, on whatever device they want, in whatever location they want. Um, so how, how has that made your job more challenging? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it has made it terribly challenging because I was always a big proponent of, uh, to your point, that more mobile approach. Mm -hmm. um, how do you empower that? And so, uh, like I mentioned, we already had folks that were full-time remote as is and, um, you know, VPN is not a right, it's a privilege. So how do you design, uh, how do you design your security architecture that it supports those sorts of processes um, has been always my mindset. And so obviously the advent of cloud computing and moving to a more hybrid distributed model, uh, you really need to factor in uh, those sorts of things. What constraints do you have? Um, are you putting all your eggs in one basket? Uh, and by that, I mean, if everything's in one cloud provider or you don't do your due diligence and there isn't a geo redundancy, are you suddenly putting a whole bunch of people out uh, if there's an outage? Um, you know, I think the biggest challenges are making sure the end user experience is as cohesive as possible. Um, you know, so that without it being cumbersome and, uh, being an impediment to, to normal operations. So, you know, we, we don't want to backhaul all your traffic to our data centers, right? That's not really the approach we want in order to uh, put in certain controls. So how do we work with that? How do we make sure that operational needs are still met? You know, how do we um, make sure that patches are going out? Uh, how are we getting reporting back? Uh, you know, I think that that is an area that, um, you know, we had to shift in as a little bit as, doing vulnerability scanning for remote endpoints. Um, that, that was a little bit of a, a challenge at first. And then uh, doing all that without, again, the impact on the end user experience. We don't want to install a billion agents on, on people's computers to do all these different things. So looking holistically at how are all these things complementary, sometimes is it better to go all in on certain providers like Microsoft because you have one agent to do all these things um, so we really looked at it as um, flexible and, and trying to keep it as uh, lightweight as possible so people can do what they need to do, but we can be as granular as we need to be on our controls uh, across the board. Yeah, and that's, that's the balance, right? It's between end user experience and, and putting the security measures you need in place. Um, if you took them all out, it might even be a better experience, but that's <laughs> not going to work because you're going to get some sort of infiltration and the organization will be shut down and back to paper and all that bad stuff. Um, so it's, it's about putting things in um, th that make that as good as experience as possible while still accomplishing what you need to from a security point of view. Is that how you describe it? Yeah, I would absolutely say so. At the end of the day, we're here to support the, uh, the organization's objectives. And so if we can't treat patients, you know, either in the hospital or elsewhere, then what's the point? So, um, I, and I, I think that's, um, that's always been a part of my philosophy as I've grown. Uh, at the beginning, definitely some harsh lessons learned uh -huh. uh, that I kind of alluded to, but uh, those are great uh, anecdotes that I get to share with people as uh, I, I work with them. You know, how do you balance that? And really, um, I think that's one of the things that people don't realize when you move into this role is that this is not as much a technical role 
technical leadership as it is a strategic business leadership position. Um, you know, I, I still have to understand technical things, but more of my job is working on business problems and helping secure business processes. Uh, you know, and I can't, I have to be able to understand both very much uh, in order to be effective. You mentioned lessons learned. Um, I, I don't know if you were alluding to the idea of users uh, pushing back on um, measures as, I mean, it's a hospital and we know how things work in a hospital. We know where the power lays in hospitals. It lays with the, I call them the high powered surgeons, probably those that, you know, they're, they're gods, right? They walk on water, they save lives. And sometimes they're, they're not so gentle in expressing their opinions if they don't like something. And sometimes that comes down on IT and especially IT security. If uh, their login isn't working or something's taking longer than it should, uh, and I don't know if they give you a call and tell you what they think of your measures. Are those some of the lessons learned, you mean? Uh, thankfully, at, uh, at Reedy, we have fantastic relationships with our providers uh, and nursing staff. I mean, across the board, people are really cognizant of how important uh, information security is. Um, so I really want to to call that out. Um, that, that goes a huge way that, uh, you know, previous leadership and IT leadership, et cetera, there's always been more feedback loops there. Uh, and so thankfully no um, touching the hot stove here, uh, <laughs> at least as, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> right. um, but definitely at other organizations, um, again, thankfully not so much with, uh, with healthcare, but, uh, you know, the one that always comes to mind is there's a manufacturing plant we were working with and we set up uh, a new a new plant for them. And I was the primary person doing all the work and I put all the switches in on the guest network, thinking I would go in and put specific ones on uh, the internal one. And that was absolutely a horrible idea in the middle of setting up a new facility and without really communicating with everyone. So that's where I think the biggest uh, lesson learned was where um, you know, my, my former CEO had to come in and kind of give me a real heart to heart on that. And um, yeah, it was, it was a good lesson learned. Um, I never forgot that. And um, I try and teach that, that lesson proactively of, can you think to the most extent possible, what is the impact of what you're about to do, whether it is changing the security setting, what if you're blocking some indication of compromise, if you're, um, you know, exempting a directory from antivirus scanning is have to the fullest extent possible, what's what's the consequence of what uh, what's about to occur? Yeah, um, we talked about people pushing back a little. Uh, I think we probably don't see as much as we used to with all the high profile breaches, Scripps Health, organizations, health systems, having to go to paper, having to divert patients, pay, uh, or hospitals being sued. Uh, we, we know there's a hospital that's being sued for a, a death um, that had to do with a, a system downtime was related to that. So I think, um, would you agree that among the general users that there's much more understanding of the implications of a breach? Makes your job that's easier. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you still, part of the role is definitely education around here are some specific uh, instances where risk was realized. Um, and for better or for worse, yeah, there are a lot of very public examples now, but uh, you know, the, the other side of that is those are teachable opportunities. And I think that's also why there's such a sense of camaraderie uh, in the healthcare CISO community, especially among the, the pediatric CISOs is that um, none of us ever wants to be in that position. We really collaborate on how can we, how can we be most, most effective at our own organizations? Um, you know, and that includes the user education side for sure. I'm gonna ask you an open-ended question here, see where you go with it. What do you think is the most interesting, compelling uh, technology trend in, in healthcare security, healthcare IT security? Um, that you think your colleagues, maybe some of them are not totally locked into, but they should be. So what's something you're seeing, feeling, paying attention to that you're saying, this is important 
and I think it's it's coming. It's on the way, or it's it's gaining importance. And so we give everybody sort of a heads up about this. Any thoughts there? Boy, uh, top of mind for me, uh, something that doesn't have commonplace usage yet, but I think should and will uh, is remote browser remote browser isolation. Uh, that I think is a really unique approach, um, especially if you take uh, a proactive approach on making it more integrated with your other controls. Um, you're not just buying a tool for a tool's sake, but how does it fit in with uh, your web filtering or application control systems, things like that. Um, that reduces a really significant amount of risk. Uh, if you can keep, uh, keep malware from ever reaching a system, that sort of remote isolation and some of the more granular capabilities too from a, a phishing standpoint, if you can block people from actually uh, putting, providing input on a website, uh, you know, they have those capabilities where you can view it, but you can't enter anything in. Um, I think that really goes, goes a long way um, and not necessarily everyone's looking at it yet. It's certainly gaining traction. Um, so that, that would be my number one answer. Um, yeah. Perfect. All right, I'm just going to ask you one more question. I, I want to, I like to keep these interviews to 30 minutes. We could go for an hour, but I want to keep it to about 30. Um, end on a, a nice light note. How does a kid with asthma wind up being a division one men's rowing athlete? <laughs> Son, how, how'd you manage that? That should inspire all, all the asthmatic children out there. Yeah. Uh, I'm very, again, very fortunate that uh, my freshman year of high school, I just wandered into rowing because of my, my carpool. And uh, as I started rowing more, actually, my asthma became much more manageable. I stopped needing to take a daily inhaler. Um, so throughout my entire rowing career, I actually didn't even touch one uh, versus before I was taking daily, you know, once, twice, even three times a day. So uh, I think it really helped control um, how bad my asthma could get. Uh, I think, you know, yeah, there's probably some limitations it put on from what was my potential, but it, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to hold you back from still pursuing those opportunities. And um, it was really, it was great to not have to think about it for a really long time. Actually. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, uh, do you still uh, row at all casually or recreationally, whatever you call it? When I can, yes. Uh, yeah. It's it's tough to get out there. Um, you know, this is first and foremost, but um, any uh, anyone who's used a rowing machine knows how painful those are, but that's usually the easiest one is Go do that. I'm going to go do that right after this, actually. Oh, good. <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, Sahan, it, it was a pleasure. Wonderful to talk to you. I really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to catching up in the future. Absolutely. Thanks again. Really appreciate you having me on and uh, hope that was helpful. Yep. <laughs>